rise for the pledge. Okay, hey. we need a motion to appoint a pro tem, which would be Mark Beeler. Motion by Meg, second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then we need a motion. Uh, is there any changes to the agenda, Bob? Um, we uh, made a few typographical actions to some of the salary notations for the professional certificated staff. Uh, and um, we did add from Friday until today, a brief executive session for personnel at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, so we need a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Sue, second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Then we need a motion to go into executive session uh, for the purpose, purpose of personnel. Motion by Barb, second by Brad. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. We'll adjourn to the library. This will be a 30 minute executive session for personnel and we will be back for action. Presentations now. So we have a presentation on Project SAMI College Workforce. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Strauss. I am instructional coach for STEAM and STEAM coordinator here at Salamanca City School District. I work behind the scenes with teachers, administrators, and program partners to build and develop our STEAM programs here. Uh, before I begin my, our, our presentation, on Project Sammy, I first want to uh, thank a couple of people. Um, first and foremost, our uh, district administration and high school principal. Uh, without you, uh, we could not do innovative and engaging programs like this. So thank you for all you do to support us and uh, gather the resources we need to implement and develop programs like this. Um, I would like to thank our colleagues, Dr. Graham Hayes, Ms. Kim, Mrs. Kim Dry, and Mr. Gene Jankowski. Um, they help collaborate in developing this wonderful and I hope to be groundbreaking program and our guidance department and program partners and of course our local colleges and universities. Thank you. Uh, to begin this presentation, I, I think uh, the best way to approach it is to actually um, rewind a little bit back to 2019. Uh, we just finished um, building our award-winning STEAM Center. Uh, you can see Bob in the bottom right-hand corner uh, 
about to cut the ribbon. Next slide, please. Um, we were bringing in through grants and various resources, new equipment to teachers and getting them training um, in things like 3D printing, drones, manufacturing, and AR, VR. Next slide, please. And I, 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 um, I, I save it proverbially, but we were, our, our program was gaining steam, uh, engaging and authentic and uh, transforming instruction here at Salamanca City School District. And it, it, you know, it went to show uh, we were getting a lot of recognition by the press. Um, next slide, please. Uh, winning awards left and right from local, state, and national organizations. And it used to be that we would send our people to other regional school districts to kind of pick apart what makes their program successful. But in four years, we actually started to see a reversal of that where other school districts are sending people to us, to our STEAM program, to kind of pick apart and see what, how we um, made it happen. Um, but then something um, challenging and difficult happened, and I'm gonna try to hold back the tears. Um, in 2020, like many school districts across the nation, um, we had to close our doors to our brand new STEAM center and switch to a fully remote plan and I, I'm not going to lie, that was hard. Uh, many people and many families and faculty included um, just wanting to um, do something good, but feeling like we, they were out of reach. And um, that's kind of what, what brought us back full circle um, to developing this Project SAMI program. We, next slide, please. We uh, were hoping for the best that in the fall we could safely bring our students back and um, reduce our full capacity, but preparing for the worst if this pandemic continued and we would um, have to switch permanently to remote instruction. The question is how can we continue to facilitate authentic student-centered STEAM instruction at a distance? Because as you get, everyone knows in this room, STEAM is very hands-on um, and it's not always uh, fiscally um, possible or um, responsible to send a $50,000 equipment um, home to uh, students on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So uh, we got together as a team, um, K through 12, but specifically for this program in the high school, um, as we were meeting um, each day, we kind of brainstorm, what, what can we do about this um, to still continue um, STEAM instruction in an authentic and engaging way for our students from remote? We started with what resources do we have? So we had an excellent GIS and college credit class already scheduled for the fall and a um, highly qualified um, instructor with in years of industry experience. Uh, we had a steady art STEAM center. Um, as you know, we had a plant, we had college credit courses um, in abundance thanks to partnerships with St. Bonaventure University, JCC and SUNY Fredonia. And of course, we had our award-winning program and reputation that we were uh, was on the rise um, in our state. Um, and we took a look at that we had advanced manufacturing, drone inspection, utility telecommunications, and corporate farming are huge, high-impact jobs in this region. You know, uh, if someone is skilled enough, they can get a job right out of high school, no college education needed, easily earning thirty-five dollars an hour to weld two pieces of metal together. And I say that not to simplify it, but just to illustrate how close um, our students would be at attaining such a um, high impact, high quality career. Um, but in order to do that from a distance, we would need to offer um, quality STEAM training to students at a distance. We also realized we needed some advanced curriculum, um, some uh, a self-paced LMS, and I'll get to more to that in a second. Our educational technologists will elaborate on that. We wanted to make sure that our STEAM program at a distance would be engaging and hands-on. And we, of course, would need funding to do so. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the background of where the Salamanca Agricultural and Maker Initiative came from. Um, it is a distance learning, next slide, please. Um, distance learning progressive education opportunity that addresses the urgent need to foster critical workforce skills as identified by New York State's Department's a Labor Call to Action. Um, we offer eight career-driven training programs through a distance learning platform, and it's original to Salamanca City School District. 
Um, to my knowledge, no other school, because many school districts across the nation during this time were being reactive and um, actually just trying to survive, um, our team in the STEAM department took the time and opportunity outside of the classes and normal responsibilities to be proactive. How can we uh, plan for a quality program in light of this pandemic? Next slide, please. Those are the programs listed on the screen, which our students will present and talk about in a second. Next slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mike to Dr. Graham Hayes, who is filling in for one of our students who is excited to be a part of this program, but cannot be here tonight. Just have to picture me younger, not so gray. I'm, I'm Dr. Hayes. Um, I have been, I am the newest oldest teacher in the high school. Pleased to be here and excited about this program. Uh, what we're looking at here in terms of agricultural landscape technology is not landscaping or you know trimming bushes and things, but it's actually looking at the entirety of a, of an of a farm, the terrain, the soil, the slope, the aspect, the the climate, the the runoff, and all of that to say how can we maximize the benefit to the farmer by taking technology that we have drones and geographic information systems because everything has a place, everything is someplace and using that magic of where to apply the skills that we have to help the, the students understand how best to apply their technology. And, and I'm not, I'll say a little bit more later, but I'll pass this on down. Is that the correct thing? Hi, uh, I'm Mitchell Schnaufer. I'm in ninth grade and I'll be taking the, um, the uh, electrical code and drone inspection certificate. Um, I decided to take this because I wanted to uh, further my education and learn about uh, drones. And so there's a lot of job opportunities in this field. Um, I can go into the military if I wanted to. Uh, there's um, uh, positions in real estate and in um, other fields like uh, at the power grid and, and many, many, many others. Um, the, this is really a great opportunity and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, it, it, it really will uh, help in the future, whether I decide to go to college or I decide to just go and work uh, with this certificate that I would uh, receive. My name is Matthew Schnaufer and I'm taking the same SAMI course, inspect, um, electrical code and drone inspection. Uh, I decided to take this to further my education and um, go further with drones and electrical engineering. I enjoyed flying drones in my free time, and I thought that it would be really cool to be able to turn it into something that I could make a living from. My name is Greg. I also en enrolled in the electrical drone code and drone inspection. I entered this because in the world of firefighting, firefighters can't always get a full view of roofs and of roofs of massive building fires, which I'm planning on eventually joining the fire force. And so an example of drones being implemented into the fire departments is in Los Angeles, they have drones attached with these things called ticks. Well, and ticks are also called thermal imaging cameras. What they can do is fly over the buildings, and if they see hot spots where fires are, or if there's anyone trapped under rubble, they are easily able to find them. I'm, like I said, I wanted to join this course because it will further my, it will deepen my knowledge of how to fly the drones and how to safely fly them in high dangerous areas, such as those high voltage towers and fire scenes and the forested areas for search and rescue, along with disaster scenes. Hello, my name is Connor Sparks. I have not taken the electrical code and drone inspections program, but I do have something to add to that. Um, something that drones have that are being, there's a drone that's being developed 
And what it does is it looks sort of like a UFO. But what it is, is it's a drone that uh, can put out fires using low frequency sound uh, around 30 to 60 hertz, which is barely audible. And it will essentially displace the oxygen and kill the fire. Um, it's called the fire sound. We do technically have the technology to make it, but we just, it just hasn't really been made yet because I guess people don't want to, you know, spend the money on it. But it can definitely be used. Would definitely be helpful. <clears throat> okay. Hi, my name is Lauren John, and I was originally um, recommended to the SAMI program, and I chose digital forensics. I chose this because I was really interested in learning how computers work, and when they when things go wrong, you can figure out how to fix it and prevent the problems from happening happening again. I also took this class because. I, the college credit would really help. And it's just a career I'm willing to partake in in the future. So I feel like taking this would better, would better prepare myself for whatever career I strive to work towards in future endeavors. It's like passing a hot potato. Um, unfortunately, the student that is in this program, engineering and manufacturing technology, could not be here tonight, but he sends his regards. He had a sporting conflict. Um, this program is about preparing. We actually offer two different tracks that are similar, um, but slightly different. This particular program prepares students to be one of two things, a leader in the manufacturing industry, so learn about things like lean manufacturing and manufacturing systems, as well as um, how to uh, troubleshoot and repair manufacturing equipment like a PLC or operate a CNC machine um, or engineering technology, which is more on the design side of manufacturing where you're creating specific tools. <laughs> No problem. Um, <laughs> so they <laughs> they will study everything that the manufacturing technology program, but also uh, focus on doing other things like designing tools for the manufacturing process for their CNC machines. Um, you know, an operator. Um, of a CNC machine, just having that knowledge alone can easily earn um, no college degree required, $35 an hour uh, with a high school diploma. So um, this is another one of those high impact, um, high um, wonderful opportunities for our students here at Salamanca City School District. You heard from me before as a student uh, in the uh, landscape architecture. Uh, we can also apply this to business management of a farm. Like it or not, the, the, the way things are going from uh, family-owned farms kind of converting to corporate-owned uh, businesses, but we still need people to understand the business model behind farming and how best to get the product to market and look at the comparison of that, plus uh, organizing and running the farm, HR uh, skills, business, like a, a business degree, um, accounting, uh, all sorts of other applications that could come into play so that the person could have a focus on the business side of running the farm, as well as uh, possibly looking at the uh, uh, um, health of the, of the, of their, of their, uh, land, uh, their livestock, etc. cetera. It may not go the full route of being a vet, but at least knowledgeable about what things to look for in their 
in their cows, chickens, uh, pigs, and and you know get the right the right uh, uh, treatment for them, etc. So there's a there's a, a large aspect to this that we hope that we can instill in the students to expand their knowledge and their and their growth potential. Uh, this program was added post um, developing our program. It essentially is an independent study, but we think it has a strong value for future uh, cohorts of Project SAMI students. And this was requested by one of our students, CJ Parmenter, who said, I really like the engineering technology drafting side of things because I, um, my family owns a custom snowboarding design company. We design custom snowboarding for customers. So I'd like to uh, learn how to create a 3D model and create uh, 3D objects of these custom snowboards. Um, but I also have a strong interest in um, biology and biomedical to be specific. Um, do you have anything that could kind of um, as a second career allow me to continue my family's business, you know, the snowboarding or uh, in the case of our steam fair this year, she actually built a full uh, size uh, go-kart. Um, do you have something that could help me with the design part of that, but also allow me to pursue the career? Because I have an interest in the medical and the biomedical too. And even though we did not, the colleges we were working at did not have a specific biomedical technology program, they did have a biomedical program. In addition, they also had a drafting program. And they had a course that the students can take that's basically like an independent study student capstone project. So we talked to the college and said, can we combine these uh, three items together and create something custom for a student? Because part of being in education is being student-centered and adapting instruction to their needs. And you know, the answer was yes. And so we're very excited to offer this as a custom program for CJ Parmenter. And we will also, um, if the program goes well, this would be a pilot. Um, we'd like to offer this to future generation of Salamanca students as well. My name is Sue Schnaufer, and I am the district technology coach. Um, I'm really excited about this project for students. Um, in my former life, I was a college professor who taught in distance learning scenarios. I think this is really exciting for our students. And you can see there's quite a variety of students. There's some that are missing. We have quite a variety of students, both boys and girls, that are interested in these programs. Uh, my role will be to run the learning management system. A learning management system is an online piece of software that not only delivers content, but also allows students to um, take quizzes, tests, uh, review, and upload assignments to the teachers. This learning management system will be student driven. The students will be working independently with the guide of different faculty members. Um, and I will be administering the learning management system, helping the students through all of the different pieces, very similar to my job with class pages in PowerSchool. Can we put the next slide up, please? This is a little preview of the learning management system. You see that uh, content can be delivered via text. There are some assignments that can be handed out so the students can see the actual assignments, what needs to be done. They can also get video assignments um, or instruction right through here. This is a drawing, uh, drawing assignment that's up on the screen right now. There's some different pieces of equipment that they're going to learn about for this particular assignment. This is a video, so I'm sorry. Here's an actual piece of machinery that will go home for some hands on. Um, electrical. Um, I think this has to do with the towers, inspecting the towers. So different kits will go get some hands-on experience as well as their online learning. Pretty intricate stuff. So in addition to hands-on, the learning management system, um, though you'll see that able to take assessments here, um, one of the things that we are preparing our students for here in Salamanca, not only to be online learners, lifelong learners, 
Um, also to be able to take online assessments and review. We have other programs here in the district that are preparing our students. These type of um, learning management systems are used in colleges and in training courses everywhere. So this is a really great experience for our students to be able to use this type of um, product. They can actually take their online exams in here. And one of the really cool parts is this simulation. So uh, as part of their program, they will be able to use simulators. So this here is a CNC machine where um, the students will be able to practice with the simulator before they actually go and work on a piece of equipment. They'd be able to test out their program. They'd be able to fly a drone uh, and get some practice. On a side note, uh, my future son-in-law's mother is actually a simulator designer for the federal government, for the Department of Defense. Um, these simulations are very popular when you're working with high-end equipment, very expensive equipment. A lot of places are training their people on simulators. This is the, actually the drone inspecting the power lines. Um, in order to save money, uh, create a safer environment and get their people trained quicker. So this learning management system will be in addition to class pages. It'll be a completely separate. Um, the students will have support uh, through myself on all aspects of the uh, learning management system, as well as the faculty members that will be helping them with the actual content. And I just wanna say as a parent, I'm really proud that we are able to offer these programs to our students. Um, I think as they're going out into the world, uh, they're going to come out of Salamanca with some experience that's going to be second to none um, all around the country. And I think we're really lucky here to have the group that we have working with our students to bring all of these, whether they go to college, whether they go on the military, or whether they go on to a career right out of high school, our students are going to have opportunities that they've never had before. So I want to thank you all for supporting this. So as you know, um, Salamanca is a unique school district and we're all about building equity here um, amongst our students and um, increasing our students' opportunities to learn a diverse curriculum across a wide spectrum of previous unoffered programs is part of our DNA and part of who we are here. Next slide, please. Um, this is gonna open doors for students by introducing them to comp competency-based education that partners every student with an industry leading curriculum, linking students to programs that provide career and technical education at the highest level, readies them to enter the workforce with significant skills from the start. Um, side note, and um, something, uh, Mr. Schaap, Justin Schaap and I, um, he helped collaborate and develop this program as well. And he uh, he's not unable to be here tonight, but, um, Something that he brought up as a possible um, output of our program in Project Sammy is a, um, I guess, and I, I don't, um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I'm not an authority on this, but in the past, there, there have been indigenous uh, winter games here. I think they called them a mudcat, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but one of the dreams that he has for this program that I think is brilliant is where the students actually start to uh, manufacture these use of winter games materials and use them in a, uh, a winter game hosted here in Salamanca once again. Any questions? get a certificate for every course you complete, is that right? Excellent question. So um, basically the, we're turning Salem Make a STEAM program into a mini college of sorts. So the students can choose a one of eight college majors while they're enrolled here in Salamanca High School. And by the time they graduate, they will have a college credit workforce certificate. They will have taken an industry standard exam to uh, verify their credentials and skills. And they um, will have trained on a um, high impact, high output uh, piece of technology that can be immediately applied to industry. So at what grade level would they start? It's gonna um, vary according to students. We have some students that are 
they're in their junior or senior year that's our science program and they'll just be working very hard to if they're in their senior year get it completed by the end of the senior year on average the average student's going to start their sophomore year it takes one to two years to complete project sammy um, we do have two full associate degree programs that we're offering those will take closer to three to four years as they're working 40 minutes per day throughout the school year good question I think one of the great things is the fact that a lot of this technology is is uh, tr cross transferable. You know, flying a drone. Oh, gee, I can't do that because I've only flown it around power lines. No, I mean, if you learn, if you become a licensed drone pilot, you can apply that in any field. That's what I fell in love with GIS because I could do anything with it. If everything's got a place, and, and so we're we're really building a wide swath of skill set. Even if they pick farm and or, or wildlife. Um, wildlife management, they can apply it anywhere after that. Just to further bill on Dr. Hayes' point, um, so the electrical code and inspections program, um, there's kind of three aspects to our um, Project SAMI programs. There's the content. So with the electrical code, they're studying electrical engineering theory. Um, that's the content. Then there's the technology application. So they, um, for all four of our drones programs, they are studying drones and GIS and applying it to that specific field that they have studied in the content. Um, and then um, we capstone it by their, them, um, a, taking a industry standard exam. So for example, in digital forensics, uh, they, um, I'm sorry, electrical code, they'll, they'll be taking a uh, electronic technician exam, which validates their skill and be able to uh, troubleshoot and repair electronic components, which is great for manufacturing. Um, but the, each student in a, each of these programs is required to do a senior capstone service um, project. And that does two things. One, it allows us to provide a free and um, wonderful service to our community um, where students can practice a skill, but also it also allows them to start to build up that reference base for future employment. Good question. My mom with me again. Sorry. That happens. Um, again, all of you guys did a great job. Um, it's it's nice when we get to see young faces come and present things that you're you're passionate about, especially you, Graham. You did great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's nice to hear and to hear the technology that's going on and to hear the things that we're doing that other districts aren't doing. Um, I watch Chicago Fire all the time, but that's the first time I heard a drone might be able to put out uh, a fire. So that was that's pretty cool. Um, I, I'm pretty excited to hear it, and I'm fully supportive. I don't know about the rest of the board members, but I tend to talk a lot. That's what I'm binge watching right at the moment. So <laughs> two seasons behind, but my family's getting sick of me talking about it. So, but hearing how a drone could actually go into a fire and detect if there's bodies. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's, so it's, it's pretty neat. I learned something new. Yet again. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have our school and safety reopening. Thank you, Mrs. Ray. The good news is I do not have much to share with uh, reference to the school safety and reopening. Um, and actually, I'm not so sure that reopening is really fitting anymore as far as the title goes. We have 17 days left of regular school for the remainder of the school year. We are at about 91% um, of students who are back. The remaining students have elected not to come back, and we're continuing virtual instruction for them. Um, the summer programming is about out. If it is not, I anticipate it'll be out within a couple of days. We have 
a minimum of four full weeks for Prospect and Seneca um, for students across the board um, with as well as um, intervention that's also going to be provided for uh, students as needed. Um, and then a full complement of high school uh, programming uh, to help students who either want to get ahead for next year um, through their high school or need to do a little bit of remediation or catch up from things that they perhaps didn't um, get done this particular year. So all in all, things are going um, exceptionally well. And I'd once again like to just extend my gratitude to the staff for the great job that they do each and every day. Um, you know, I, if I hear unprecedented times and troubling times one more time, the, the words are starting to lose the effect, but the fact is um, our teachers are working in an environment that they really haven't had before. Um, and I'm proud to say that they've overcome a lot of the obstacles, the time that our students have been back. I can't quantify, but to say that they have um, shown X number of growth, but anecdotally from the, the teachers, some of the concerns that we had in February and March um, when students were not back are beginning to dissipate. Um, meaning they're seeing significant learning and improvements in even just the short amount of time uh, that our students have been back. That's on the academic side. On the social emotional side, we're seeing um, an increased need for deeper understanding, which our teachers are terrific at, um, but that is causing some awareness for us for things that we need to do a little bit differently moving forward just in the next couple of weeks, but also to provide some resources over the summer um, and throughout the year next year. So when you say summer programming, that's for K through 12? Correct. And then what time frame will that run? So right now it looks like we start the week of July 12th and we end on August 5th. Some of the other programs will extend beyond that. Um, summer school for the high school will start, I think a week before then. Um, that's the academic piece. We also have athletic camps that'll be running as well. Um, that'll be the first uh, summer that we've actually had sort of formalized, formalized informal athletics um, that'll run through a, uh, a range of sports for a range of age groups. Okay. Can I ask the big question? What's next year going to look like? So that's a great question. Um, next year is going to be a challenging year. We've spent quite a bit of time talking about, you know, what does the return to school look like in the fall? We are preparing for, I'm gonna call it a normal school year, meaning we may have masks on, but we'll be back for the normal school day um, and the normal school calendar. What will not be normal is the typical rotation um, in let's say fifth grade, where it's X number of minutes for math, X number of minutes for social studies. We're looking at how we can combine that time and utilize it more effectively. We're looking at how we can work across grade levels so that students aren't necessarily, they'll be in fifth grade, but they may be in a sixth, typically sixth grade math class, um, or they may be working with some fourth graders in a mixed classroom. So we've talked in the past about you know mixed classes. We're looking at doing that across the board and particularly with grades K through six. Um, so that our students are given what they need. We call, and that's sort of a, a term that we've been using for the past several years is we call it win time. And that's what I need. And that's in contrast to I'm in sixth grade. So I get sixth grade math modules or Eureka sixth grade math. The reality is we're going to have some very significant gaps. Um, our interventionists are going to be really put to the test. Um, year is a posting that was out and I'd like to once again just express the gratitude on my part as well as I'm sure the staff for the addition of an assistant director um, who will be assisting with a comprehensive evaluation of our intervention. And those are the strategies that we use when we see students who aren't achieving where we would typically see them achieving. Um, and that individual is going to help us get our interventionists to become more efficient in the time that they have, um, and therefore see larger gains with our students um, academically. So we're not anticipating, or we're anticipating a return to normal logistics, meaning the calendar is the same as it has been traditionally, and the calendar, or the time frame of when school starts and ends, but what it looks like during the year is going to be significantly different. All right. 
You got it. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Then we need a, uh, let's see, we need to move on to public communications. Is there anyone on from Title VI? Um, I do not see anybody on from Title VI. Okay, thank you. Then we'll go on to central office message. Levi, is there any uh, public comment questions? Oh, yeah, I forgot on about social that. media. Uh, there are some comments on Facebook, but um, nothing particularly uh, relevant to questioning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then let's start with Karen. Do you have anything for us tonight? Um, Friday will be first round of uh, interviews for food service managers. Uh, we have eight people that are being interviewed. There were over 24 that applied from actually around the country. Uh, which was kind of interesting to see that people were willing to, you know, come to this area to, to do this. Um, a couple of them are local. So uh, we'll be moving forward with that. Um, the practical uh, interview will be on June 21st, which is when they'll be doing the cooking. So if anybody's available on the 21st, let me know. I'll make sure you're invited. I got to <laughs> I got to I got to find that out yet because we got we got the people coming in from Connecticut that are uh, overseeing this whole process with us too. So um, I'm not sure what time. So, uh, and then, you know, just wrapping up the year and trying to get next year started and all the usual deadlines. Is it? Anyone have any questions for Karen? Narrow down that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, ch the chop panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, Dr. Beeler. Again, as I mentioned before, I extend my gratitude to our staff. Um, I mentioned the teachers, but that really goes across the board. Our administrative staff um, has done a terrific job over the past four weeks and what we anticipate over the next three weeks not just with getting our students back safely, not just with getting um, our learning as close to normal as it can be, um, but also with the incredible amount of hiring that's been going on. Uh, we're with our certificated staff, we're hiring 42 individuals and that process is extensive from screening candidates on paper to potentially screening interviews of short term to first round with a committee. And once again, that goes to our teachers too, who are taken out of the classroom for um, those interviews, then to teaching a lesson. Um, and then once again, to the final step, which is typically Mr. Bridenstein. Um, and if you think about that, you know, that's 40 positions. And for each one of those, we've interviewed um, four to seven candidates. Um, and all of that has had to happen during the day while we're also teaching school. So things have been pretty um, hectic to say the least that is not over. Um, there are uh, several teachers on the agenda tonight. And I just wanted to make a note that, you know, especially to those people who are being hired tonight, you're gonna hear some of your friends and, and maybe your family members say, oh, that's terrific, you're so lucky. Um, you're not lucky at all. Each and every one of you has gone through that process that we just talked about. You're the best person for this job and nothing happens by luck. You have earned that position and you should be very proud of that. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, once again, say congratulations to those individuals as well. And uh, again, a thank you to all of the staff who've been working really hard this year. Thank you. Have any questions for Dr. Beeler? Then we'll move on to our Board of Education message. Barb, you wanna start out? That in my calendar too. <laughs> <laughs> Tie your string around your yeah. I will, that will work. Um, 
I, I just want to say thank you to the students that presented. That seems like it's creating a good career path choice for them and seems like a good salary for them to start out at. That was very interesting. And um, my husband and I took a walk around the walking path the other day around Vets Park, and he wants to use the batting cage. And <laughs> my, my son, who played center football, would like to come back from Colorado and try to kick a field goal. So. They're, they're looking forward to seeing it, but he's, he's very impressed with the, the scoreboard and, and everything that the school has done over there. It's a great job and it's a nice walk around the path. Yeah, I wanted to uh, also, I'll, I'll second what Barb was saying. The, the, what's going on at Vets Park is awesome. You know, we're in full swing of spring sports. Uh, something's going on every day. It's exciting. We got great contests. Um, we have issues, but if we didn't have issues, uh, I don't know if we'd be normal, you know? So it, it's really exciting and it's great to see all that. Um, but I did want to commend the district. Uh, I don't know who was behind it, but yesterday it come up where uh, they asked everybody in the district to wear orange in solidarity with the 215 uh, recently found deceased children uh, at the Kamloops uh, boarding school. Uh, that's awesome to show that level of support for somebody so far away and quite frankly in another country. But it transcends countries because when you talk about indigenous folks, this was all one land, this was all one continent, this was all Turtle Island. There wasn't a Canada, there wasn't a United States. So when us as indig indigenous folks think about this, this is our people. This is, this is us. We are them. So for our district to reach out and promote that solidarity, that's awesome. That's amazing. Um, I'm wearing my orange. I wore my orange at work today. I, I wore an even louder orange. For those of you on, this is the orange I'm wearing. It's even louder. Um, but I wanted to make that point that it is important that we support them. We're in, we're in a native district. We're on native land. We are on an indigenous reservation. And it's very important that we all understand that and we all know that. And when we see these atrocities that happen, it's great that we can come together and support. It's great that we can unify ourselves for an issue that is national. It is actually the entire continent. So I commend whoever come up with that, fully supportive. You guys are awesome. Um, along with that, I did want to ask uh, for Dr. Beeler to give us an update. Um, we've had a My Brother's Keeper grant now for a little while, and we were working on curriculum to develop indigenous curriculum for our district and potentially move it on to even the rest of the state. So with that, um, Dr. Beeler? Certainly. So we have the NACTI, which we're referring to our Native American curriculum team. Um, that is primarily Gabrielle Papa and Jerry Musial. Um, we have also struck a deal to begin work with Bill Krause, but primarily Gabrielle and Jerry have been working each and every day um, to build a curriculum around um, the textbook Iroquois Corn, uh, which really begins to outline a lot of where some of the misconceptions about Native Americans um, arose, arose from. Um, it's actually specific to the Iroquois Nation, so it's very applicable to um, Salamanca schools and serves as a terrific backbone for instruction moving forward. Uh, they have outlined a timeline. They've begun to put units of study together. What I would like to do to answer your question more thoroughly is have them come to the June 15th and provide an overview for everybody. It'll be much more detail than I can present probably more accurate and more efficient because you're probably also tired of hearing me talk all the time. Um, and they're immersed in the work every day. So um, let's get them on the agenda. Um, they will be happy. We, I meet with them probably once a week to sort of monitor where we're going and get them what they need. Um, and uh, we'll hear from them exactly where they're at. We've had several other districts who we're looking to partner with. Um, Gowanda has recently reached out so that we can do some collaboration together over the summer and pool the resources together so that in the fall we have some actionable items to move forward with. Uh, I did also want to mention, you know, this is something 
Obviously, if you on social media in today's age, you see everything that's going on. And this weekend was just flooded with the issue of this 215 uh, recently found deceased children. If you're not on social media, you probably know nothing about it. Um, it doesn't really make the mainstream news. It doesn't make mainstream media. It's social media, and it's mostly shared by people who take up the cause or who agree with the issues at hand. Um, one of the things is indigenous people. This isn't something that complaints or criticisms or anything else has just recently begun because of social media. This has been going on for decades, centuries, years. It's only recently become newsworthy because of social media. People are actually starting to listen because as indigenous folks, we've found a voice. That voice is social media. All of a sudden your voice reaches millions instantaneously. So these issues have been going on for a long time. This isn't new. It's just, we finally found a voice. And with that, again, our district decided to stand in solidarity. And again, Yahweh. Um, we have been commending our teachers and rightfully so, but I would like to also mention the, the students that, you know, this has been hard for them as well. And um, I would like to commend the kids for coming to school every day, working through our problems and, uh, you know, I know it hasn't been easy for them, and uh, I commend them. So thank you. Brad? I just want to thank the students for their presentation and the, the STEAM work that they're doing. Um, I think it's very exciting to see the programs that our students in this district are exposed to. And I'll get ahead a little bit and just say congrats to all the new hires that are on here. I see some familiar faces that I'm happy to have joined in the district. That's all I got. Oh, and speaking of social media, I got to get a hold of Levi and find out who his hairstylist is. I saw some, <laughs> some pictures out there. His new hairstylist? Mr. Siebert's already probably got it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd also like to thank the students for, for presenting tonight. The, the Project SAMU looks like a wonderful program with great opportunities for our students to either go on to college, the military, you know, in the world of work. And, uh, you know, um, the fact that they earn those skills uh, doing project-based learning um, is, is awesome. And also, um, I'd like to congratulate everybody who was going to be uh, on board with us this year. Congratulations. And I don't want to say too much more because I know Mark has to uh, take notes tonight and, and I don't want to overburden him. So thank you very much. Meg? Okay, um, yeah, I'd like to thank the students as well for pre presenting. Um, as someone who works in, in higher education, I love the certificate option for students for them to graduate with a high school diploma and a certificate. Um, you know, as it was mentioned, not only can they go directly out into the workforce if they want to, but if they change their mind later and they wanna pursue a college degree, then they already have that certificate and they already have those credits there. So it's, um, I, I think, just a really great path, um, you know, for, for our students and what a great thing that our district is doing. Um, two other things, I don't know how many of my fellow board members I took a peek at the um, Onboard magazine that came recently, but Salamanca was highlighted in it. So hopefully you didn't chuck that into your recycle bin. Um, so we um, had a little like preview thing on the on the front cover, the top front cover of it, and then had a whole full page spread on the on the last page, um, highlighting our district um, in terms of the DEI work that we're doing, um, in terms of our Seneca curriculum and Seneca language. Um, we have a number of our staff members, you know, that were interviewed in that um, you know the author is pretty awesome I won't go on about that because it's probably nepotism but um, <laughs> it's um, really really nice a uh, nice spread and people are taking note of that you know around the state it's it's a big deal to be highlighted in that way and that in that magazine um, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about that's the newsletter that comes out for um, New York State board members 
Um, so yeah, so that was that was neat. I did hear too that I think there's going to be a Seneca language quiz bowl that's in development, and I'm very excited about that. Um, so we're we're just making you know <laughs> good, good strides as a district um, to to kind of echo and um, expand a little bit on you know what, what Carrie said. I was I was elated last night to get the text message from from Bob and to see on social media about the the wearing of of orange. Um, and you know, as Carrie mentioned, this isn't just a this isn't just something that happened in another country. Um, we had that same thing here in the United States. Um, Canada is being pushed to investigate some of their um, what they're called residential schools. We call them boarding schools here in the U.S. The United States has been really resident to do that because they have the same thing. Um, you know, so it's it was you know using ground penetrating software that they were able to see mass graves. We have that here, so don't let this be something where we just point a finger and go, "Oh my gosh, Canada, what did you do?" Because um, guarantee that is that is here. Um, we already have our students that are educated in that. I know that um, Rachel Wolf and Jerry Musial have taken our students to Carlisle um, School in, in Pennsylvania, which is one of the the most famous of the boarding schools. Um, but you can go, you know, tour that site today. There's online records and things, so our students are aware of that. Here locally, we have Thomas Indian School. Um, and it, for those of you watching through social media, and you know, those of you that are new to our district, too, coming from other places, there's a really great documentary that came out a couple years ago called Unseen Tears that that interviews people who are survivors of, of Thomas Indian School. Um, so I'd really recommend that, especially again for those of you that are new to the district, to get a sense of what our community has been through. Um, this isn't something relegated to history either. Um, children in our district have grandparents that attended boarding schools um, and residential schools. So, you know, this is something that's that's very real um, in our community. There's a whole bunch of resources, you know, if you're interested, um, you know, see if we can maybe push some of those out. I know that our um, prospect library has some books that are, you know, appropriate for, for little kiddos. Um, to learn about this. I'll make a plug for one that's on my bookshelf, which is called Unseen Tears. Um, oh, no, Unseen Tears. Um, when We Were Alone, which is about a brother and a sister who um, are now grandparents, um, but, you know, kind of recalling their boarding school days to their young children. And it's a, it's a book you can read to a four-year-old, because I did. Um, but there's a, there's a whole list of those resources to have those discussions, because, again, we have families in our district um, who experience this. Um, so it's, it's, something, it's not something that occurred far away. It's not something that occurred 200 years ago. Right? Um, it's something that is, is very recent history. And that wasn't the most uplifting thing to end with, but I think it's appropriate. So sharing that and although my shirt is not orange because i don't have an orange shirt i apologize uh orange is in my heart so uh, i certainly um you know it's just the atrocities sometimes that people commit against other people uh is really shameful um and like you said meg i'm sure it has gone on here so just uh don't be blind to to what happens and and make smart decisions and and uh, you know uncover the past so we can never um, so that we don't do it again. You know, if anything, history is supposed to teach us about learning so that we don't repeat our mistakes and and that's really important and that things like that shouldn't shouldn't go unrecognized. You know, if there's something out there, even when it's uh, something you don't want to admit to, you need to know about it. So thank you for really sharing that in detail. And that's really all I have. Again, thank you to the students that presented and to all the teachers and everybody that, that's really helping out and um, making our school something to be recognized. And maybe that onboard article, Bob, we can get in the powwow so that everybody can, can see it. Yeah. So mine must be stuck somewhere. I've got yeah. a lot of comments for it, but mine hasn't. Mine came like a week or so. Yeah. Ago, yeah. But, uh, so it'd just be nice for everybody to be able to see, um, besides the board members, of, of what we're doing out there. Bob? Yep. Several quick items and a little bit longer one for this evening. Um, for Carrie's question, the wearing of the orange to stand united with um, the students and their families from Canada uh, came from one of our students. Um, and uh, I, I don't know which student, I got a simultaneous, almost instantaneous text and message from uh, Rachel Wolf and uh, Michelle Redeye 
uh, asking for about the, uh, to be able to wear the orange. And of course it was an instantaneous yes. Uh, so I wanna commend the unnamed student who saw something that wasn't right to make sure that that didn't go unnoticed. Um, for the student earlier tonight who was talking about uh, a, a career in biomedical drafting, I'm here to tell you as a parent of a recent uh, college graduate and master's level graduate, these are the jobs of the future. They are uh, incredibly plentiful and available and they pay pretty well too. So a uh, little bit of a proud dad moment. And as a reminder, the students that we have today will be entering the workforce in two and three and four and five years in jobs that have yet to be created. And that's the economic engine and the economic model for the future for these students. There will still be jobs that have been here for decades and uh, generations, but there are new jobs, uh, lucrative jobs that are being created and will emerge almost seemingly daily. And we serve our students best when we prepare them for the unknown, where they can be successful in a field that they enjoy. Uh, and I was proud of the students uh, in both of those instances for uh, taking a stand and advocating for themselves. Um, on Thursday and Friday of this week, Changing Gears, uh, the board uh, has graciously uh, made arrangements for Coyote Cafe to be on site at Prospect on uh, the third of this week, uh, Thursday. And then on Friday, there'll be two trucks on the main campus for staff appreciation. And um, board members are invited to come either or both days. We'll have plenty of um, uh, food truck food for everybody. And we've invited the Seneca Nation uh, Education Department to join us as well. Um, uh, one other little bit lengthy issue is an update. Um, while there was a lot happening on social media, this was probably missed because the state really isn't interested in reporting this. Um, over the weekend, the, United, uh, the New York State Supreme Court, the highest court in New York State, issued what I would categorize as a landmark decision impacting small city school districts like Salamanca, like Jamestown, like Olean. Salamanca is an active small cities member. I serve on the executive board and have served on the board for almost my entire tenure as superintendent. And approximately 13 years ago, some courageous districts uh, formed the Maisto litigation indicating and representing nearly a million small city school district students who argued that Governor Cuomo has failed to provide an adequate appropriate education to small city school districts and their children. The eventual eight Maisto districts, the most current one is Jamestown, support and recognize nearly a million small city school district children from across New York State. When the litigation was uh, presented approximately 13 years ago, everyone said, you're fighting an uphill battle, don't waste your time. And a few small districts uh, across the state dropped out of the litigation, but the Hardy Eight remained vigilant. When it was presented, the uh, school districts argued and presented experts that the New York State Education Department, the New York State go uh, Governor, Legislature, and Senate had failed to provide a basic constitutional right to an appropriate education. And all of these eight Maisto districts represent districts of high poverty, high diversity, and they were struggling, particularly at a time when the gap elimination adjustments and foundation aid were promised and revoked. These districts presented their case, argued well, and the uh, judge overwhelmingly denied all of their claims. These eight districts, these courageous districts, with the help of the Small City School Districts Association New York State appeal. The New York State Appellate Court remanded it back to the judge. And for those who don't know case law or the process, it goes back exactly to the same judge, who then has to decide, did they make a mistake? This judge affirmed every single one of the arguments uh, that she was told to review and said, nope, I did it correctly. These eight districts, at great expense to their own constituencies and communities, appealed to the New York State Supreme Court. 
This weekend, the New York State Supreme Court unanimously reversed that decision and said they did not provide an appropriate education to small city school districts. This is monumental. Over the course of the last eight or nine years, the Salamanca School District has contributed to the legal defense of not just the eight Maisto districts, but over a million students who attend small city school districts. The fact that the, United, the New York State Supreme Court unanimously slam dunked this back and said New York had not lived up to their constitutional requirement is an extremely significant landmark case. It's a repudiation of bully tactics to not properly fund school districts. And the fact that the only course forward for the governor is the United States Supreme Court um, bodes very well for the small city school districts. I have not seen the total decision yet. Um, I know that the volume of uh, materials submitted were quite literally by the tractor trailer full. Um, so uh, it, it would be quite a voluminous record to go through all of it. I do not have a timetable when the state has to respond and institute changes for those districts. But the bottom line is eventually, in short order, this rising tide will lift all of the 57 small city school districts. The eight at the front of the line should and rightly be the eight Maisto districts. They have borne the majority of this fight with the support of other districts like Salamanca, but this is a landmark case and they as a districts should be commended for their courage, their tenacity, their fights, um, and they have rightly earned this victory as have the eight uh, Maisto districts from across New York State. Thank you. <clears throat> so we need to uh, move on to our consent agenda. So we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Barb, second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. And our old business, we have our policies. Uh, so we need a motion to approve policies 6120 and 6150. Motion by Dale, second by Brad. Are there any questions on these two policies? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. And item B is our 2021 spring and summer adult ed catalog. So we need a motion uh, to approve the community ed. Motion, motion by Meg, second by Sue. Are there any questions on anything in the catalog? Okay. Then all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. We'll go on to new business. Our contract was Second Life Mac. So we need a motion to approve the agreement for 11393 Motion by Barb. Second by Dale. Are there any questions on the contract? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then uh, our library collaborat uh, collaboration, we need a uh, motion that the board authorizes a superintendent and a designee to begin the collaboration discussions. Motion, motion by Meg, second by Carrie. Are there any questions on this? Uh, just a quick comment, um, following up from several board meetings ago, I've had the opportunity to meet twice with the library board, um, uh, just, uh, a few weeks ago, and then uh, a couple of months ago, I met and spoke with the um, mayor twice, and we spoke um, one of those times was this morning. And this is for future collaboration efforts with the library board, the city of Salamanca, and the school district. We believe that there are some efficiencies that we can um, collaborate on that will provide maximum benefit to the community. That's pretty exciting. Item C is our, our bus bid that we, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Janet. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. We have a motion by Meg, second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Just get ahead of myself sometimes. Item C is our bus bid. Uh, so we need to accept the bid that we received from Matthias and Sons. It was the highest at $4,000. So we need a motion to approve. Motion by Sue. Second by Brad. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And item D is uh, our audit firm. So we need a motion to uh, approve Lumsden and McCormick uh, is our cert for our certified public accountants from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2025. Okay. Motion by Carrie, second by Barb. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then item E is our MOAs with our SSSO, CSU, confidential managerial, uh, and our employee and CSU. So we need uh, a motion to approve all of the MOAs. Motion by Megan, second by Dale. Are there any questions on any, any of the MOAs that are listed? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item F is our confidential managerial contracts. So we need a motion uh, to approve the confident, confidential managerial contracts. Motion by Sue, second by Barb. Are there any questions? I do have one. Why is Janet's at four years and the others are at three? Um, that was a request from the specific employees that sent it one year. Um, Based on trajectory and timeline to go for a of the final contract. Oh, okay. All right. Are there any other questions besides my question? <laughs> then we have a motion by Sue, second by Barb. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. And item. G, we are going to create and reclassify a position. So we need a motion to create and reclassify. Motion by Brad, second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And item nine, our personnel consent agenda. For A is for review, and it is a couple pages long. So, item B, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Meg. Second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Oppose? Abstain? One abstention. Sue has abstained. Uh, motion carried. All in favor. I said, right? Yes. Getting out of my zone. All in, so we got six yes, one abstain, motion carried. And now we will introduce the staff. So we have uh, several of our folks who are with us and have hung in there. Uh, normally our meetings um, don't go along this long, but we uh, did want to afford the students some time. Uh, so we will do introductions, and I will start with Mr. Siebert, because he's the first person I see on my screen. You... All right, can you hear me now? So I'm not sure if Mr. Howard is on, but it is a great pleasure to welcome Sean Howard to the high school staff. Sean has spent close to 20 years teaching tech ed, most of which has been at Pine Valley. Uh, we are fortunate to have secured him to our STEAM program. He has a master's in tech ed, so we will be able to continue to offer our tech classes for JCC credit. He has taught these classes before and his experiences with these classes will pay large dividends for our students. He also has a unique ability to engage students 
and that is going to help grow our tech and STEAM initiatives. We heard from students earlier tonight about Project SAMI um, and how that's starting to grow. So we're hoping to continue to grow that. He brings a vast amount of experience and expertise, but he is excited to learn the new things that we have and offer our students. He stated that technology is an ever-changing environment and that they as tech teachers are continually learning about the new initiatives. So it is my pleasure to welcome Sean Howard aboard the high school staff. Mrs. Beaver. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to welcome Scott Rosinski to Seneca Intermediate. Scott will be the new STEAM teacher. He is innovative and ready to take the middle school STEAM program to the next level. He has a variety of experiences that will be beneficial to our students and staff. So as we continue to teach and master 21st century skills, we are grateful to have Scott at Salamanca. Also online, I believe Chelsea Cole. She is a Salamanca alumni that comes highly recommended. Chelsea brings enthusiasm, experience, and spark to education. It is clear she has a passion for our Salamanca students and community, and she will go above and beyond to help our students find success. Welcome back to Salamanca and welcome to our team, Chelsea. I believe Holly Urbanski is on the call tonight. She brings significant experience in education to Seneca Intermediate. I am confident Holly will use her enthusiasm and drive to provide our students with a high quality learning experience. We are so excited to have you at Seneca, Holly. Welcome on board. And Jesse Moore, he has been a part of the Salamanca family as a teaching assistant for a while. Jesse is eager to learn and always willing to give his best. We are excited to have him continue to work at Seneca as a classroom teacher and believe he has a lot to offer our students. Thank you for sticking with us, Jesse, and congratulations. Vaughn. Oh. I'm excited for the two hires at Prospect Elementary. Um, we have two alumni coming. Um, Jeanette McClure has been a teacher assistant at Prospect for multiple years and is now going to be transitioning to a kindergarten teacher. Um, so we're excited to have her continue in a different role. Um, Emma Isaac just completed her student teaching and um, brings a lot of energy to um, what could be a kindergarten position or a K-1 multi-age position. So we're excited to have Emma on board and happy to have two alumni join our building. We also have uh, two administrative positions and I'll start. And if Ms. Pavone and Mrs. Uh, Beaver want to jump in, um, we have Kim Oaks, uh, who is coming to us from uh, several years of experience at Erie Tuboses. She has previously been a special education site supervisor for Boses and the director of early childhood education in Ripley. Um, one of the reasons why uh, Kim rose to the top of our um, interview process for assistant principal was her um, expertise and familiarity in bringing staff development and training to individuals in the field uh, and needing to grow as uh, persons uh, interested in expanding their professional horizons. Newer teachers uh, looking to make sure that they are solidly engaging in pedagogical discussions in the classroom. Uh, Kim is coming to us. Um, uh, from a wonderful set of experiences at Uri Tuboses that fits very well with our district goals and objectives of uh, professional development for all members of our organization. And I'd like to welcome Kim. Uh, Aaron Berry is a similarly situated administrator with a number of years experience uh, looking to relocate back to the Western New York and Southern Tier area. She has experience in uh, dealing with uh, diverse populations, as well as uh, children who are struggling with poverty and an exceptional set of experiences with early childhood engagement, literacy, and intervention services, particularly with some of our more challenging students who uh, have not yet found their success and footing in uh, more of an intermediate setting. 
Uh, and we're delighted to have Aaron uh, relocating and coming back to the Western New York area and joining our team at Salamanca. Ms. Pavone or Ms. Beaver, anything you'd like to add? I would just like to say welcome aboard and congratulations. And I believe that is everyone for appointments that is. Mr. Brady. We have one more. I'm sorry, Mrs. Dudek. I'm sorry, our occupational therapist. Yes. My I'd glasses like to... are fogging up with my mask. Not a, not a problem. I'd like to take a moment to uh, introduce Kaylee uh, Zidel. She's coming to us as our new occupational therapist, both for special education, preschool evaluation and education, and also to assist a prospect. She'll be supervising our CODAs that are found at both buildings and her wealth of knowledge being in some very unusual situations throughout her both time um, as a student, but also her time in the city of Buffalo. We're excited to have her bring that wealth of knowledge to work with our students and individuals here in Salamanca. Congratulations, Kaylee, and welcome aboard. Yes, congratulations to everyone and welcome to the Warrior family. We're really, really glad to have you. Yep. <laughs> We're going to move on to item D, which is a superintendent contract amendment. So we need a motion to approve that contract amendment. Motion by Dale, second by Sue. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And item E is our consultant agreements. So we need a motion to approve our consultant agreements. Motion by Dale. Second by Carrie. Are there any questions on any of the agreements? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. And then item 10 is our board information and reports. Um, item A is a note of a voluntary reassignment. And B is our personnel and instruction committee meeting minutes. Uh, C is our second reading of our policy 6120. D is 6150, which we already approved. And we need a motion to uh that's kind of messed up somehow yeah I think that's somehow item f is our thank you card we did get a thank you card from uh yeah you're right on it mark do you want to read it okay we did receive a uh thank you card here from uh jim johnson carol ellis and uh, amy rivera um thank you for your help in providing food boxes over the last several months they were a great boost in trying times like ours they are most appreciated get a uh, congressional proclamation from the House of Representatives. So from Tom Reed, do you wanna? There's a lot of words. I know, I I'm read I'm happy them. to. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> we don't get a proclamation every day, you know. No, we do not. From the House of Representatives. Whereas today we come together to honor our veterans and celebrate the city of Salamanca, the Seneca Nation, Salamanca City School District and the greater Salamanca community as we officially open Veterans Memorial Park, having many diverse activities for years to come. And whereas this newly built Veterans Memorial Park will serve as a central location for the community to come together for athletics, powwows, exercise and other healthy activities, and whereas Veterans Memorial Park will host countless football and baseball games, track meets, and so much more on its multi-purpose fields for the students and families of Salamanca School District, and will have the honor of displaying the largest scoreboard in the New York State. And whereas Tom Reed, member of the United States House of Representatives, proudly recognizes the achievements of citizens and organizations who have contributed meaningfully to their communities. And whereas in accordance with this tradition, the 23rd Congressional District of New York hereby honors those who have worked to improve our community and ensure a better tomorrow for all of our residents. Therefore, be it resolved on this fourth day of May in the year 2021 and in acknowledgement of this occasion, 
United States Representative Tom Reed proudly calls upon and urges all residents of the 23rd District to recognize the stakeholders of Salamanca upon the grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony for the newly established Veterans Memorial Park. Signed, Tom Reed, Member of Congress, New York, 23rd District. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure. I mean, it, it is, you know, I know it was pretty long winded, but it is important to recognize everybody that did come together to help make it possible. So thank you. And uh, we did over. We missed. We missed. we missed. It was a mistake. We're going to acknowledge it. Best for last. Yes. So we got a couple other people. We need to so we have two tenure appointments and uh, I see that one of them is online. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Siebert in a second. Uh, and the other one is not on the line. Uh, Julie Studd is uh, receiving tenure uh, this evening. Uh, and Julie is a teaching assistant at Prospect. Um, we've been blessed to have Julie with us for about four years and uh, she is retiring in December. So we do really appreciate all of the work for um, that Julie has done on behalf of the primary kids and the students at Prospect. And Mr. Siebert, I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Bob. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Lynn McGarra. Uh, Lynn has been a vital part of the Salamanca High School, dis, uh, High School and District. Her leadership with students, teachers, parents, and programs has helped the high school excel over the last few years. Uh, Lynn is extremely well organized and meticulous with details. These attributes pay huge dividends in the daily operation of the high school. Lynn is always willing to step in, help out, and be a leader. She has been a true partner and ultimately in doing her job so well makes everyone else's job that much easier. Last year, and although Dr. Beeler said I'm not allowed to use, what words were they again? Unprecedented and challenging. But <laughs> last year was obviously very challenging for everyone, uh, but Lynn's work, ethic, dedication, creativity, and willingness to go above and beyond to do whatever it takes to help students succeed has been vital to the teaching and learning that we've been able to accomplish. I'm not only extremely happy to recommend her for tenure, but I also want to thank her for all that she's done. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn, very much. Sorry for the oversight. Uh, the other uh, upcoming event too that I want to remind everybody about since Carrie reminded me, uh, is the Cindy Moore 5K run, uh, which will take place on Saturday at Vets Park, so, or I'm sorry, Sunday at Vets Park. Um, and at so, what time is registration? 10 o'clock, 9, 9.30. So if you haven't registered, you still can. You can show up at Vets Park and the, the more, uh, more, more is better. So <laughs> for as many people that... Uh, please come out and support. And with the, go ahead, just say it on today. I'll, yes. Well, what it is, is it's uh, uh, started by the class of 2023. They're also uh, raising funds for their class, but half of the money raised during this event will go towards a Cindy Moore scholarship that was established this year in her honor. Um, a graduating senior or seniors will be presented with a scholarship uh, in a few weeks. issue. Um, and I'm going to put Mr. Siebert back on the spot again. On Thursday, we have a flag raising uh, that the board had approved um, what seems like several months ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and you may have noticed as you pulled in, there is a new flagpole that has been installed directly outside the high school, which will be a dedicated flagpole uh, for this. Mr. Siebert, do you have a time that the students are going to um, uh, begin this process and unveil the new flag? Yes. Unfortunately, they didn't allow you and I and Mark to put the flagpole in. They wanted it upright. Like, <laughs> it um, but no, on 215, it's scheduled to start. Um, all staff, any students that wanted to attend, any community okay. members that wanted to attend uh, are more than welcome to, to be there for our flag raising ceremony for the pride flag. Thanks, Chris. Yep. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, 
we need a motion to go into executive session and for personnel. For personnel. Motion by Meg, second by Barb. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We do not anticipate returning, I don't think. No, nope. okay. we do not. <laughs>